Acts and Letters of the Apostles, Lesson 28, Authentic Faith, James 1-2. What confusion do you have about your life and your place in the world? Do you struggle to live out what you say you believe? How often do you substitute feelings, fear of consequences, majority opinions, past outcomes, cultural norms, or governmental laws for God's wisdom? Instead, James's message is, seek God, get wisdom, do the word. James confronts life's most important issue, authentic faith in a deceitful world. His first audience faced trials similar to what believers face today. Gentile majorities mostly looked down on Jewish people. Both Gentiles and Jews increasingly opposed Christians. Families and churches were persecuted and often torn apart. Believers lacked money, influence, and ability to bring social or government reforms. They worked under oppressive, greedy leaders. They battled sinful habits. God knew everything about each one as he does today. They had faith, but needed correction and leaders devoted to him. God provided a practical book by a practical leader with mature faith. How can James help you clear up your confusion and mature your confidence in God as a disciple of Jesus Christ? Section 1, Overview of James. God's inspired word through James describes authentic faith. The teaching includes examples of actions, so readers both see and hear the way to live. Questions remain about the author and timing, but the message is clear. God-given faith is a faith that works in loving response to salvation. Original audience. The letter seems written to circulate among Jewish Christians outside Jerusalem. They were from a Jewish background, among the working poor in their communities, immature in faith, oppressed by people and circumstances. Author. Among the four men named James in the New Testament, James the Lord's brother is the most likely author. However, there are other valid opinions on this point. According to scripture, Jesus' post-resurrection meeting with James transformed him. He went from unbelief to a spiritually mature leader in a short time. Occasion. Context favors dating the letter between AD 43 and AD 50. This means the letter, written within the first 20 years of the church, is the earliest epistle preserved in the New Testament. When the Holy Spirit came in power on the day of Pentecost, more than 3,000 Jews believed Peter's gospel message. They returned home and shared the good news in their synagogues. Waves of persecution drove more Jewish Christians from Jerusalem. These new Christians needed leaders and teaching to mature in their faith. Main message. James states his purpose is to help believers live out their faith. He warns stragglers who stray from truth. He encourages stronger believers to return these strays to the fold. James calls all believers to see life as a series of tests. Each test offers the choice to faithfully trust the Spirit and obey God with the love of Christ. Section 2, Trials and Temptations. James 1, 1 to 18. Salutation, 1, 1. Letters in James's day commonly began with the author, recipients, and a greeting. James identified himself as a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Greek word doulos, translated as servant, suggests wholehearted devotion to another's will. Mary, the mother of Jesus and James, identified herself by this same term when Gabriel foretold Jesus' birth. This choice highlights relationship to the Lord through faith, equal to other believers. James never sought special honor as one of Jesus Christ's physical family members. James chose to call the recipients the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. It is thought this term identified them as Jewish Christians. Jewish people of Israel were scattered among the nations, some by oppressors in earlier times, while others emigrated voluntarily. Many chose to remain in those places. Jewish Christians from Jerusalem went to them. Paul took the gospel to many synagogues as well. Trials of many kinds. 1, 2 to 18. Believers face temptation to focus on self in every trial. Why did this go wrong? 
Why did God let this happen? Why did this happen to me? Through James, God gives some answers to these questions. But James commands believers to move past why me to ask, what will I do now? His answer is to live by faith. James gives God's will for those who seek him in our troubles. Respond with joy. This joy comes when believers trust and obey the Spirit, regardless of circumstances. Persevere in faith. Spiritual maturity develops by tests, practice to respond God's way to situations. Gain wisdom. God fills in when tests reveal doubts, weaknesses, and confusion about how to proceed. Be humble. Who has Christ, yet feels sorry for self? Pity the rich who take pride in things that end. Expect blessing. Perseverance shows the power of salvation and grows anticipation to see Jesus. Resist deception. God never tempts anyone. God never desires any person to sin. Trust God. Nothing good can be gained apart from God. Nothing bad comes from His hand. Tests occur all day. Believers almost constantly get to choose God's way or their old way of life, the way of the world. James calls believers a kind of first fruits of all He created. 1.18 Non-stop testing proves God's patience to grow His children in faith. Jesus told His closest disciples they would remain in the world, but not of the world. They are to show all people everywhere the love of God. Self-deception and favoritism. James 1, 19 to 2, 13. James echoes Jesus' teaching from the Sermon on the Mount. His words cut to the heart. These words are for believers. The Spirit gives truth and guidance to become Christ-like. Therefore, James calls believers to action. Take note, be quick be slow, get rid of, and humbly accept are actions directed by James. Doing God's word, God's way, brings about humility, impartiality, and compassion. Self-deception, 1, 19 to 27. When believers joyfully submit to God, they are not deceived. God is God and believers are grateful and dependent for life. Their relationship with Him will be evident in their words, temperament, integrity, and priority to serve others, especially the needy. Controlled Speech James's letters teach the value of speech like no other biblical writer. He openly denied and ridiculed Jesus Christ's claim to be God until after His resurrection, so He knew how much suffering could be caused through words. Here, He says, words spoken in anger cannot produce God's righteousness. Jesus said, angry words are evidence, murderous desires are at work in the heart. Righteous life. How are we to live? God desires believers get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent. God's word reveals the problem of our moral corruption and the solution, turn to God in faith for cleansing from sin. James says the Bible is like a mirror it shows us our true condition. If believers see their sin, but do not turn from it through God's power, they are fools of a worthless religion. Care of the needy. Faith is true religion when believers enter into others' suffering to give the love of Christ. This sacrificial investment for God's glory is how Christ came for us. Orphans and widows represent the lowest ranks within greedy societies. When we care for the truly needy, nothing can be expected in return. Believers are also to resist entering into sin or enjoying any aspect of its presence in the world. This command calls for honesty and responsibility. In both helping others and resisting sin, believers cooperate with the Spirit and obey God's Word to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. The terms translated religious and religion in 1, 26-27 refer to reverence or fear of God shown through conduct. Authentic faith, or true religion, shows the joy of salvation through service. This is the religion of those who not only hear the word, but also do the word. Hearing without doing is likely to produce self-deception. 
doing without hearing is often works-based attempts to earn favor with God. Favoritism, 2, 1 to 13. James condemns favoritism, discrimination. It is sin, not discernment, and not love. The Lord of glory laid aside his divine prerogatives to identify with and save us, sinners with no merit at all. The unchanging Lord is known in both humility during his earthly ministry and in glory with the Father. James must have seen such self-serving, judgmental treatment of rich and poor. Evil thoughts about what we can get from fellow believers must be rejected. Instead, God is to be glorified for what He has freely given to all. Be impartial. The Lord is impartial, but Christians are often lowly and looked down on by the elite of their societies. With an ironic twist, James reminds his readers the wealthy, powerful people to whom they give such deference have not always treated them well. The church members were exposed to exploitation, arrests, court hearings, fines, and blasphemies against Jesus Christ from those judged noble in their own eyes. Be loving. James quotes, love your neighbor as yourself. This royal law is part of what Jesus called the greatest command. James is wise to anticipate those who discriminate may be quick to reply they simply love their neighbor. Self-deception may cause others to say their actions are about personality, not prejudices. James's point is the royal law extends to all neighbors equally, rich and poor. God's word convicts those who flatter the rich and mistreat the poor. Neither action is God's love. Be obedient. James says partial obedience is disobedience. When we break one part of the law, we break the entire law as well. The royal law is part of the Christian's law of liberty. By God's grace, believers have the freedom to choose not to sin. Believers can submit to the Spirit and offer God's mercy instead of human judgments. God, who looks upon the hearts of all people, is rich in mercy. How much more should His people, who can only see outward appearances, delight to offer His mercy instead of wrong, partial judgments? Section 4. Faith Produces Works James 2, 14-26 Authentic Faith 2, 14 James sets out this truth. Authentic faith is a faith that works. Sometimes confusion arises when people compare the teachings of James and Paul about faith and works. When Bible students consider all that both men wrote that is contained in God's Word, confusion is resolved. Context is crucial. Paul wrote largely to Gentile believers, and James wrote largely to Jewish believers. Paul focuses on how works have no relation to our justification, or establishment in salvation. James focuses on how works necessarily relate to our sanctification, or experiences of our salvation. Paul's audiences often distrusted grace. They fell into legalism and earning favors from God. James's audience often distorted grace, so they fell into denying works were necessary in the Christian life. Examples of Faith 2. 15 to 26. James gives examples of both false and authentic faith. The examples have to do with outward actions. The conclusion in verse 26 could not be clearer. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. False faith. James first addresses false faith, a faith of empty words. False faith has several characteristics. Powerless. False faith knows about saving truths, but is a stranger to living by their power. God-given faith includes transformation in accordance with proclamations. Tragically, people can say they have faith, but not have saving faith in Jesus Christ alone. James says, in effect, if your faith is only an intellectual faith, you are at the level of demons and Satan. What we know and how we feel are not proofs of salvation. Useless. False faith does nothing of value. It produces no results. 
When our Lord talked about the Holy Spirit, he said the Holy Spirit was like the wind. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. God the Holy Spirit is invisible, yet he is observable in his effects. In the same way, authentic faith, which produces fruitfulness as believers cooperate with the Spirit, is also observable in its effects. Dead. False faith is a dead faith. A faith without works is not God-given faith that saves. Dead faith can deceive its owners into believing they have life. The distressed orphans and widows James already mentioned can be seen again in his commands against favoritism, discrimination, and in giving empty words but nothing to live on to a brother or sister without clothes and daily food. Authentic Faith Authentic Faith of Abraham James contrasts the false faith with Abraham's authentic faith. Such faith is complete, words and deeds working together. James is not saying Abraham was justified on the basis of his works. He is saying Abraham's faithful obedience when God commanded he sacrifice Isaac proved his faith. God had already declared Abraham justified, declared righteous. The evidence of action outwardly confirmed faith for Abram and Isaac's benefit. Faithful action also serves as a testimony from God's people to encourage one another and to display God's power to the world. Authentic Faith of Rahab James directly confronts the original audience's discrimination. He upholds the Gentile prostitute Rahab as equal in authentic faith to their beloved patriarch of the covenant, Abraham. Look how the unifying power of Christ exposes and overcomes worldly prejudices in race, gender, heritage, education, profession, class, and past behaviors. By grace through faith, Rahab also believed God. He credited her with righteousness. She spoke her beliefs and confirmed with self-sacrificing actions. Her family legacy includes her own Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Faith works. Faith lives in hearts born for obedient service through saving union with Jesus Christ. If such works are not present to express our union with Christ, then James denies the reality of the union. James's unavoidable point is the nature of God-given faith is to work in cooperation with the Spirit to please God. Why does God allow suffering? Why do such terrible things happen? There is no simple answer to the horror of sin. Its consequences bring suffering of many kinds to all God's creation. James says temptation and sin come from evil, never from God. Adam and Eve first revealed their own evil desire enticed them to sin. The wages of sin is death. We think only of ourselves in the moment we sin. Only God knows the depth and extent of suffering that will result from our choices. We often suffer from others' sin and evil corrupting the world. God created people to be united in peace, but sin unites us in suffering instead. Jesus Christ will bring sin and suffering to an end when he returns. In the meantime, the Bible gives some reasons God allows suffering to occur. Some suffering is common. Job said, yet man is born to trouble as surely as sparks fly upward. He meant sin corrupted everything in God's world. Bad things happen in nature and among people. Jesus reminds his followers such suffering does not prove guilt, but urges all to turn to God. Some suffering is corrective. The psalmist wrote, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I obey your word. God allows some suffering to guide his children back to the path of true discipleship. Some suffering is constructive. God allows some suffering to increase believers' faith and the power of their witness to the world. James and Paul both teach the Spirit matures us into Christ's likeness through suffering. Some suffering is cosmic. Some suffering is to bring God glory, as Jesus explained in the case of the man born blind. Faith in response to suffering amazes both the good and fallen angels in the invisible, spiritual realm. This testimony is the point of what happened to Job. 
Testimonies to God's ultimate triumph over suffering will be celebrated forever. The confusion about works. Works as an attempt to earn salvation or favor with God is false faith. Ephesians 2, 8 to 10 clearly teaches against such works. God inspired Paul to clearly state, it is by grace you have been saved, not by works, so that no one can boast. No one can be saved in the sense of justified by human works. In Galatians, Paul even pronounces a curse on anyone who would dare to teach differently. However, Ephesians 2, 8 to 10 also includes, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Here, Paul speaks about works to be done by those already justified in salvation. In this case, works are absolutely necessary. This proves God ordains works for all who are born again. These are the works James is focused on in relation to the audience who first received this letter. Tragically, some people believe saying words without being careful to live by them is salvation. They believe conduct is irrelevant. James disputes this thinking. He says God-given, saving faith is a living faith, a faith that works in obedience to God's Word through the Spirit after the example of Christ. If works are not present, people with such a faith do well to examine themselves. Seek wisdom through the Holy Spirit about salvation. A sincere profession of faith followed by a changed life with good works, not a mere profession alone, is confirming proof of a person's salvation. Take to heart, hold fast. God knows and cares about every heartache and hardship. This is why the Father gave His Son. He promises to remove sin and renovate His creation and His people. Suffering warns everyone death is coming and has come. Sin separates us from God's plan for everlasting bliss. God extends His gracious invitation to repent and believe in Jesus Christ. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. God's grace is greater than our sin. His glory outweighs all suffering. It is often easy to find fault with others, but we must confess and address our own acts of favoritism. James gives wisdom to deal with sinful discrimination between supposedly important and unimportant people in our churches, workplaces, and social circles. Stop viewing the rich as potential sources of money for paychecks, projects, or pleasures. Stop lavishing attention and flattery on people for what they have or how they look. Stop being barely courteous to those who are plain, quiet, without wealth, lonely, or difficult. If we look to God's glory and see people His way, we will never make such distinctions. James agrees with Paul and all great teachers of the church about three elements of authentic faith. God-given faith includes content, assent, and commitment. There is no such thing as a saving faith apart from knowing Jesus Christ, eternal and fully Son of God, became fully man to live without sin die on the cross for our salvation, be buried and resurrected three days later. He ascended, sends the Spirit to indwell believers, and will come again. New life empowers ascent. I agree, it is true. The triune God worked salvation for me. New creatures in Christ commit to this ascent by following Jesus to become like Him through the Spirit. Authentic faith is God-given faith that reveals content generates new life to agree with and live by what is true. Does this truly describe your life? Apply it. Have you woken up to the reality of moral filth described by James? The overwhelming sights, sounds, and smells of suffering, death, devastation, and loss are unavoidable. James says believers avoid moral pollution by being consumed with the glory of Jesus. Yet, avoiding contamination is not believers' greatest truth. Our greatest truth is Jesus saves. Commitment to long-term, self-sacrificing, loving service to our neighbors is required. Who knows the grace of God, the freedom of forgiveness, the love of Christ, the dignity of personhood, unmerited hospitality, a kind word, and practical material help from you because Jesus loves to save? Why is there desertion by a spouse? 
illness, the death of loved ones, terrorism, or bigotry. Such things are profoundly troubling. Even the strongest Christians ask why God allows suffering. There is truth we can know. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. Do you trust God's character? Do you trust he knows all things and what is best? Do you believe he delivers our ultimate good as part of his new creation? Do you persevere with confidence of his love? Even when suffering is not fully understood, will you take comfort in his presence, his love, and promises of future glory? God brings his glory to bear on all creation. God the Father, Son, and Spirit is truth. His truth speaks to cosmic mysteries and every common practical matter. Is this the God you honor throughout your day? Do you share James's priority of doing the word in devotion to God? Do you trust his goodwill above all things? What have you learned through BSF to mature your faith so far this year? How are you better equipped to recognize evil and seek wisdom? James's questions about favoritism call for serious reflection. Has God given you material benefits? If so, do you selflessly use them to help others? Do worldly desires for wealth and fame tempt you to flatter the rich and ignore the poor? Is your focus on the Lord Jesus who gave everything for you? If so, you will be known among your church family as content, gracious, delighted to share, and humble to ask others for help when needed. This concludes this week's lesson. Thanks for listening.